Check this shit out. This here is part two of my series covering all the NES games that were two-player cooperative. That means games that you could play simultaneously on the same team with a buddy. Last time, my nephew helped me play through all the classic beat-em-ups, and if you haven't seen that yet, I'll link to it in the description. This week, I'm going to roll through all the running guns, joined by my buddy Ashley. Hello, Ashley. I've known Ashley for some time now through our involvement in the Atlanta art scene. He's probably the only friend I have who actually knows what the hell I'm talking about when it comes to video games, especially more obscure and off-the-wall stuff. He's been making work based on video games for some time now, incorporating elements of sprites into elaborate digital collages, drawings, paintings, and much more. He even had a solo show of different Marilyn Monroe paintings based on this tiny image of Warhol's Marilyn screen print that shows up in the background of Shinobi. He's also one of the nicest, funniest, and most genuine dudes I've met. He's always making new stuff, so I'll link to his websites in the description if anyone wants to check out his stuff, which you should. What defines a run and gun? Well, here's my take. A run and gun is a game where the screen scrolls horizontally or vertically and the goal is to move around while shooting enemies. Unlike the shooter, the screen does not scroll automatically, instead moving as your character moves. And unlike the beat em up, you don't need to defeat every enemy on screen in order to progress, meaning you can literally just run and gun as fast or as slow as you want through a level. And it's up to you to decide how pacifist of an approach you want to take. This is actually a lot more games than I initially thought, and it took Ashley and I three long sessions to get all the gameplay footage and audio, making this definitely the most time-consuming video I've ever worked on. You better be fucking grateful. Let's start with number 11, Uncanny X-Men. When you first boot up Uncanny X-Men, you're given the option of practice or one of four stages. For some reason, all the titles are overly verbose. Feature City Street Fight? Battle Through a Living Starship? These are all just King Crimson album titles. So you choose a stage and then you get to pick your hero. Each X person has varying stats. God only knows what a stat like willpower means in a game like this, but the higher your endurance, the longer you'll live. Not that that's necessarily a good thing. The various characters have different abilities, with three of them able to shoot a projectile and the other three able to lunge forward awkwardly. Also, Wolverine can jump. I'm not exactly sure why. It's not like there's anything for him to leap over, but it's kind of fun to make him bounce around. The screens are just a mess of colors and textures. There's generally a futuristic vibe to it, but otherwise there's little here to indicate that this is an X-Men game. The visual design of this game comes off as very aimless. There's not a really like dynamic visual feel. There's not a lot of contrast between the sizes of characters, enemies, objects. It's a very boring looking game. In fact, we'd wager to say that this was probably designed as another game altogether that then got the X-Men license slapped onto it last minute. Wait, did the X-Men explode? Is that how mutants die? It's completely unclear what on the screen can hurt you or help you, there's no perceivable health bar, and each X-Men is just a shitty palette swap on the same sprite. At some point you'll probably reach these never-ending staircases that just go on and on and on, and if you're like us, you'll probably take this as a sign to stop playing immediately. There's one plus to X-Men, and it's that the two-player version is infinitely better than the single player, which is saying a lot. If you're playing solo, you still have to select a mutant partner, but it's controlled by the CPU, and the AI for these guys is totally broken. You'll be praying for them to get killed so you can continue on, but then again, you'll probably be praying equally hard for your own demise. Moving on to number 10, Ikari Warriors. <sighs> Sadly, this isn't the only Ikari game we have to play in this video. It's called Ikari because that means Ikari, a grudge against this game. So, Ikari Warriors. It's basically a shitty Contra, or more specifically a shitty version of the overhead levels from Super C. Your characters move so slow. I'm not entirely sure if this slowdown is because we're playing two player, like in Life Force, but I'm not playing it one player to verify. I don't know why, but in spite of the fact that we're spraying bullets in every direction, it takes so much effort to actually hit someone. Like the bad guys just never properly line up with your shots. I remember renting this as a kid after seeing it in a magazine and thinking it looked cool, only to play it and think, oh, this is what disappointment feels like. You can get into these tanks, but one shot and they explode. I don't think either of us lasted more than five seconds in them. We honestly found it more fun to just blast them ourselves and drink the sweet gasoline that's left in the wreckage. 
Here we'll find the first flamethrower in this review, a weapon that shows up in many of the other running guns, and it is by far the worst of the bunch. It's the exact same as your regular shot, only with red bullets instead of white. Why couldn't they just give us the flamethrower that the enemy used? That's badass! The only positive about Ikari Warriors, I don't know, it's pretty funny how the enemy soldiers waddle backwards when they're shot. Also, the infamous ABBA code that you press when you die lets you continue as long as you wish, which is kinda nice with a run and gun as these games are typically very difficult. Unfortunately, the levels in Akari Warriors just go on forever and you'll wish after a while that you could just forget that cursed continue code. I'm convinced the stages keep going even after you turn this piece of shit off. The image of the plane crashing is a metaphor for your expectations plummeting back to Earth. It says a lot about how broken X-Men is that Akari Warriors is not the worst run and gun for the NES. How does the sequel stack up? Well, number 9, Akari Warriors 2, Victory Road. The second Akari Warriors looks way different from the original. What's going on here? Well, if you followed the story, which why would you, right? You learn that after the events of the first game, the warriors encounter a strange storm that sends them thousands of years into the future where aliens have taken over, led by the main villain, Zhang Zip. Those are real words that just came out of my mouth. Well, whatever the reasoning, the developers really made a conscious effort to make a game as far away from its source material as possible. The stages have a ton of weird design elements and features, yeah, the mirror reminds me of the Phantom Zone from the Superman movies. The alien bad guys look like rejects from a sci-fi version of Labyrinth, and the main characters got real stocky in the future. Either they both got coiled springs for legs, or time travel turned them both into Michelin men. They're like heavily armed newborns. They also added in some rad voice samples, especially this gremlin sound coming out of these statues. Come on, let's play. Perhaps realizing that moving in one direction and shooting becomes monotonous over time, the programmers added in destructible landscapes, forking paths, cumbersome mini-games, and a heart-based currency system that allows you to trade the organs of fallen enemies for, um, whatever these are. Yeah, the currency is hearts, so not too different from today's current capitalist system. Um, excuse me, do you also accept the blood of the working class here? Along the way, there are these stores where you can buy items and also a bar where you can fight these little babies for more hearts. You have to applaud the idea of inserting these shops to give the gameplay some more depth, but after slogging through a few of these menu screens, you'll find it's way more fun to just avoid them altogether. Compared to the first Akari, Akari 2 Victory Road is better in every way from graphics to gameplay to sound and music to just plain old fun. It's not a title I'd recommend by any means, but it's actually a lot more fun than I was expecting. Let's move on to another Black Sheep in its respective series. Number 8, Contra Force. Hey, Ashley has a specific Contra Force anecdote related to his art. I built some pixelated pistols based on a gun found in this game, and after making and selling those for a few years, found out that someone had seen the design online and reproduced it and was selling it on Amazon, the people who make the Minecraft toys. I talked to a lawyer and learned a lot about copyright law and what you can and can't do and what you can and can't take someone to court over. Fuck them hoes. Most people don't even know that there is a third Contra game for the NES, Contra Force. It's often derided as a poor man's version of the classic run and gun game, or even that it's not really a Contra game. Contra Force? More like Contra Farce, huh? Huh? I can kind of see it as the graphics and gameplay are a little different than Contra or Super C, but it's definitely a Contra game. You run to the right, you shoot everything in sight, you jump a lot, and you upgrade your weapons. Oh, and it's made by Konami. Case closed. Is it good? Well, let's start with some positives. You can select from four different characters, which is a huge option to have. Each of these dudes has not only a different appearance, but they've also got their own set of upgradable weapons. That's a pretty cool idea, but wait, it gets better. At any point in the game, you can pause and switch characters. That's awesome! We didn't really find a practical application for this, but I bet if you got deep into Contra Force, you'd figure out which characters are better for certain bosses or for certain levels. Also, the game looks pretty great. The sprites are nice, everything on the screen is really colorful and well-defined, and there's some neat details in the background. Looking at this is like looking at French modernist painting from the early 20th century to me. It's so beautiful, but it doesn't have any impact on the gameplay. It's art, it's decoration in the background. So, on to the bad. The upgradable weapon system, while cool in theory, is way more of a hindrance than it should be. 
It works like Gradius, where as you collect power-ups, you can decide whether you want to switch weapons or not, or use the power-up immediately. In a game like Contra, where you're dying constantly, there's really no chance that you'll be able to switch to the third or fourth option of weapon before eating a bullet, let alone gathering so many power-ups that you can upgrade it twice. That's just not happening. Also, some of the weapons suck. Like, what possible use could you have for a remote mine in a Contra game? I'm trying to run and gun here, not sit and wait, Jesus! There's an overhead level like in Super C, but for some reason it doesn't follow a totally linear path. We played this for 10 minutes and somehow ended up all the way back at the beginning. That kind of tedium is enough to make you walk away from Contra Force forever. But the real killer? The slowdown. A lot of late era titles had slowdown issues as the developers tried to pack more and more on the screen, and Konami is especially guilty of this. It's not as bad in single player, but in two player, holy shit. I'd say it makes the game borderline unplayable, but it actually just makes the game a lot easier since you're basically moving in slow motion and now have more time to react to enemy fire. Unfortunately, this isn't enough to make the game fun. There's a lot of potential here, and with a little tweaking, Contra Force should be as good as the other games in the series. We'll just have to wait for a Nintendo Switch remake or something. Yeah, they flew too close to the sun with this one. Okay, changing gears a bit to... Number 7, Gauntlet 2. Gauntlet 2 is the follow-up to Gauntlet, a title which my sister and I had growing up. I don't know where it came from. We definitely didn't purchase this bizarrely shaped Tengen cartridge, but maybe someone in the neighborhood let us borrow it and we never gave it back. This is probably why you find so many cartridges with people's names and phone numbers on them. Unlike the first game, you can't choose your character. It's just chosen for you based on which controller you're using. What's cool though is that Gauntlet 2 is 4 player compatible using the NES satellite or 4 score, so if you've got 3 friends, here's something you can subject them to. The characters in the first Gauntlet had different stat attributes which made them move faster or have more health, but the sequel does away with all that and goes for a totally equitable character select. The graphics in Gauntlet 2 are just a little more sophisticated than the graphics in Gauntlet 1. The casting of shadows, the depiction of three-dimensional space in such a limited resolution is fairly impressive, particularly see this with the graphics of the ghosts. You can gather and keep more keys, which helps you navigate the stages easier, and there's some cool, if bizarrely attributed, sound effects added in. Like this part here where you go through these kind of laser rays, what fucking sound is that? <laughs> It sounds like the hell mouth is opening. The difficulty is ramped down a bit from the first game, with higher health and fewer enemies on screen. There's also now a mystery style to finding the exits, with text appearing on the screen like, the exit will move, and to enter a secret room, watch what you shoot. Honestly, I get what they were going for here, but fuck this. In the stage where the exit moves, you can't see the whole screen at once, so even though you know you're looking for the exit and it's not in the same place at any given moment, you have no idea where on the screen it may be appearing. Here, after several minutes of wandering aimlessly, all the doors mysteriously open, and even though there was now access to all this previously unreachable treasure, we were so sick of this level's design that we just pieced out immediately. Yeah, I'd say Gauntlet 2 was less than amazing. It seems like they were going for a more exploration style dungeon crawler with this one, but since it's still timed, you're really not trying to fuck around too much and search for the secret rooms. There's just not enough incentive to fight against the clock, so then it just feels like you're playing the game wrong. But really, you're just playing the wrong game. Not that the first gauntlet is a much better choice. Number 6. Gauntlet. As I mentioned before, you can choose one of four characters, each of whom has different stat attributes. Seems like your best course is to choose a strong guy and a fast guy, but honestly, if you use the Robin Hood dude like I did, you'll spend most of the game running into the edge of the screen because you need to wait for your stronger but slower companion to catch up, and all the while you're just getting molested repeatedly by the indistinct monsters. The ghosts in Gauntlet became part of my visual vocabulary. I used them in drawings and in pixel collages. Gauntlet is way ahead of its time, setting the eventual tone for rad games like Diablo. Unfortunately, it's an arcade port, and as such, it would be a lot more fun if you had quarters to keep pumping in to continue. Instead, you're given one life, a time limit that decreases a little on its own, and a lot when you get hit, and these huge sprawling levels to explore. 
Since you don't really have time to check out every nook and cranny, not only do you constantly feel like you're missing something, but you also rush headlong into every enemy, hoping to save as many seconds as possible so that you can make it further into the game before time runs out. Gauntlet might have a ton of nostalgia for a lot of people out there. It definitely does for me and Ashley. I remember seeing one of these arcade games at Disney World from when I went when I was like seven. I remember that, and I remember pepperoni pizza with olives that I didn't want to eat because I didn't like olives. Money well spent, mom and dad. Beyond that, there is still a lot to enjoy. The music is really good, the sound effects are all equally hilarious, and the game just has a great look and feel to it, from the background textures to the enemy designs. There's not really any other game like it on the system other than Gauntlet 2, obviously, so I'd recommend it if you're looking for this specific kind of gameplay experience. Otherwise, it's time to start talking about the good running guns. Now that we've chewed the fat for a while, stay tuned next week where Ashley and I will finally get into the meat of the NES run and gun games. There's five titles left to go, and they're all straight up jammers. <laughs>